Hey everyone, Christy here, and here is the second part of the episode, Facepalm Moments of the Week. The things I couldn't fit into the Friday episode get put into a Tuesday episode, so let's get going with some crazy news. Na 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 dick moves! Government to investigate Islamic school which banned socializing with outsiders. This story comes from the National Secular Society and their work in the UK to challenge religious privilege and make sure that people are treated fairly. The Islamic Institute for Education in Dewsbury was found to be banning students from socializing with outsiders and teaching pupils not to watch TV, read newspapers, or listen to the radio. Despite this, the school was rated good by Ofsted in 2011. The National Secular Society wrote to the Department of Education and Ofsted, calling for a new inspection as a matter of urgency and asking whether the school met the previous standard at the time of the inspection. The DFE has written to the National Secular Society, confirming that it will be looking into the NSS's concerns. One of the things that I've learned from doing the Face Palm Moment series is that constant vigilance is the price of freedom. And it's groups such as religious, uh, the Freedom from Religion Foundation and the National Secular Society that are out there making sure that things don't slip under the rug, that people aren't able to get around the law because it's a small community or a small school. And so I just wanted to give another shout out, as I do almost every week, to the National Secular Society for their awesome work. Utah man justifies child molestation. The Bible did not set limits on the ages between two partners. Timothy Butler, 54, is accused of molesting two children and providing them harmful materials between 2008 and 11. One of the alleged victims was then a five-year-old girl. Butler told the judge that, quote, the Bible did not set limits on the ages between two partners and that God will set the truth free, unquote. I'm not going to slam him for using the Bible to defend himself because that's an obvious thing to do. I mean, this is pretty disgusting behavior and looking for a gap in the Bible is not a justification for the harm that he did these children, this little girl, and if he has committed these crimes then he should be held accountable and punished and society should be protected from him. But in so far as the issue of consent has become something in the modern world, 20th century especially and moving forward, um, when consent can be given, the issue of consent, I think it's, it's worth pointing out that the Bible doesn't really deal with the concept of consent. It pretty much deals with the concept of property. And when I read the story, one of the things that I reflected on was, yeah, you know, I know that there's a lot of criticism for, um, you know, criticisms of Islam when people point out that Muhammad was married to a nine-year-old girl. But what is less known, perhaps, is that historical scholars would say if, if Mary did exist and had gotten pregnant, she would have been about 12 or 13. And can a 12-year-old or 11-year-old girl really give consent to become pregnant just because her body is physically ready? Does that really mean she's ready to be a mother? And so I think this issue of age limits and consent if you want to point to the Bible as the perfect word of a supernatural being that is the guide for all human life, the fact that it does not talk about consent, that it does not talk about how old a girl should be in order to protect her from the dangers of childbirth, that she should wait until she's 16. I mean, I, and people go, oh, well, it was cultural and back in the day, you know, you could marry at 12 or 13 and have babies because, well, that's, yeah, our bodies, our biology is set to go that way. But if you want to make a claim that there's a supernatural being that's handed you a book with these guidelines, then where does the age of consent come in? Where does the issue of consent come in? Or is this really just a property text? And it kind of seems like the latter to me. Breaking the law, breaking the law. Breaking the law, breaking the law. Christians! Kansas town in uproar over removal of Jesus painting from public middle school. Another story of Christians breaking the law, violating people's constitutional rights, and through silence and, and, and people feeling too afraid to speak up, they've just continued to break the law and disregard the Establishment Clause. And then when people do call them on it, then they react as if they're being picked on. According to the Wichita Eagle, the print of Warner Selman's Head of Christ has been hanging in the hall at Royster Middle School for decades. 
However, after a national church and state separation group complained, school officials took the painting down last week. I'm going to pronounce this in how it looks to me in French, so I'm going to call the city Chanut. It's probably Chatnut, but I'm going to do it the way that sounds better. Chanut has a mere 9,200 inhabitants, but 30 churches. The decision to remove the Christian image from a public school has rankled many residents. Chanut's school superintendent, Richard Prophet, said that he acted quickly when he received a notification from the Freedom From Religion Foundation that the image of Christ displayed in a public school violates the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. Quote, we were notified and we responded to stay in compliance, Prophet said. Ryan Jane of FFRF told the Eagle that his organization has been pleased with the school's district's response. FFRF has worked with Prophet before after a complaint last year about the Gideons handing out Christian Bibles on high school campuses. The evangelical group has since been banned from handing out materials to public school students. Some residents, however, see the removal of the painting as a sign of society's slide into moral decay and degeneracy. Uh, said 22-year-old fur trapper Cody Bush, a self-described church kid who attended Royster, nobody else in the school seemed to be bothered by it. There were only one or two evolution kids, and they didn't seem to be bothered by it. The point is not bothering people. The point is that it's against the law, that public spaces are meant to be religiously neutral, that the government can't establish what religious belief or faith or even whether or not there's monotheistic gods or polytheistic gods. The government has no place in supporting any of those positions. That's what secular means. Group files complaint against judge who ordered man to marry girlfriend. The Wisconsin-based Freedom From Religion Foundation, yay, filed the misconduct complaint last Friday with the Texas State Commission on Judicial Conduct on Smith County Court at Law Judge Randall Rogers. On July 2nd, Rogers gave 21-year-old Justin Bundy 30 days to marry 19-year-old Elizabeth James or face 15 days in jail for pleading guilty to misdemeanor assault. Bundy admitted punching Jane's ex-boyfriend twice in the jaw for, quote, saying disrespectful things about her. Rogers also ordered Bundy to scrawl a Bible verse 25 times daily. According to CBS affiliate KEYE-TV, a person in Pennsylvania has started a petition to the White House calling for Rogers' disbarment for violating the man's First Amendment rights. If you're interested in signing that petition, I already have, and I've shared it on Facebook and on Twitter, you can go to the link below in the D-Box, and what you'll see there is a White House petition that reads this. Honorable Randall Rogers, a Smith County, Texas judge, ordered a young couple to get married or have the defendant serve 15 days in jail. The young lady was not asked if this was per her wishes. She was treated as a piece of property. This judge is in violation of at least their First Amendment rights and should be disbarred for this heinous act of taking away personal will. That pretty much sums it up. I wanted to keep you updated. I, I featured the story a couple weeks ago. I saw this update with Freedom From Religion Foundation, so I thought I'd throw in there so you guys can keep up with the story. Good news time! Yay! Church of Witch Slapping Pastor withdraws application to open UK school. A Christian group that linked child disobedience with witchcraft has withdrawn its application to open an independent school after the NSS called on the DFE to not grant the school registered status. The organization behind the proposed school, headquartered in Nigeria, is Living Faith Church Worldwide. The organization's bid to open its first UK school in Kent was thwarted by the NSS after the society drew the media's attention to the church's teachings and video footage of its leader, the preacher David Oyedopo, slapping a young girl after accusing her of being a witch. The Department of Education has confirmed to the National Secular Society that the application has been withdrawn. Metropolitan Police warned in 2012 that there was a clear and imminent risk of significant harm to children believed to be witches and that these views about spirit possession could lead to extreme physical and emotional abuse and to child deaths. This is a good news story for the UK. It's a bad news story in that these attitudes still exist. This magical thinking exists. This supernatural bubble where people can blame 
other for blame children for being witches and harm them it's it's hard to reconcile this with the 21st century these kinds of attitudes feel like the middle ages like the dark ages how are we still trapped in this sort of non-scientific thinking how are we to the point where the the well-being of children is not the for, first and foremost thing and it's the legacy of religion it's a legacy of how religion views women how religion views children and how religion views the way that the world operates and you know all the things going on inside of it so we have a long way to go but at the very least there will not be any children in the uk beaten or abused or mentally harmed by the school to wrap up this episode, which has had a lot of heavy themes, I wanted to do a story, I saved this for the last, because it's good on a number of levels. It's a story that does give you hope, and it's also a story that allows me to big up Christians who are doing the right thing in terms of solidarity with gay rights and, and rejecting biblical homophobia. In my view, homophobia is the new slavery. Biblical homophobia is the new biblical slavery. When we look at the history of monotheism, we have seen that after the Enlightenment emerged and ideas about human rights and human dignity, natural rights, things that were endowed with as vir by virtue of being human, as those ideas started to seep into the minds, as, as rationality and human-based values started to perpetuate um, Western Europe, you saw the rejection of slavery. And it was, you know, at least in my knowledge of world history and u.s history it was a christian debate because it was christians who were owning slaves and the christian community over decades had to come with the come to grips with the fact that there are immoral texts in their own holy bible and they had to decide as a species to reject their god's opinion on slavery and you i, I very rarely hear i have never heard a christian defend slavery if it was practiced today. They might try to excuse it in the past, but no one says, well, the slavery is in the Bible, so we should be practicing it today. Okay, maybe there's that one idiot uh, radio host who wanted to make um, immigrant slaves, but he wanted to do that not for biblical reasons. So, I mean, but just as the church had to grapple with slavery, um, they're going to have to grapple, grapple with homophobia. There is an entire generation globally that is growing up that rejects the idea that being gay in itself or gay acts of love are sinful and the church can either keep up or not. So when there are instances of homophobia, how the church reacts is a sign of whether or not they're going to survive as institutions. And with that set up, I want to then highlight this last story. North Carolina church turns the table on anti-gay bigots by painting a giant rainbow over Fags Arpedo's graffiti. An LGBT-friendly North Carolina church painted rainbow colors over its front door after vandals targeted the property with anti-gay slurs. The pastor said the church members tried scrubbing the slurs off the doors, but the paint would not come off, so they covered the hateful message with colors symbolizing gay pride. I actually thought that it was a really nice, warm, heartwarming story, and so I saved it for the last so that we could end on a positive. So until Friday and the next episode of Facepalm Moments of the Week, I've been Christy, you've been awesome. Thanks for watching to the end of the video, and I'm so close to a thousand subscribers. If you were watching this for the first time and you like the content, please consider subscribing. I think I'm like 25 away right now, and I'd really love to hit a thousand before my anniversary and the sort of 9th of September time. So if you haven't subbed me, please sub. If you have subbed me, thank you so much. I appreciate your views, your likes, and your comments, and we'll see each other soon. Bye. Hey everyone, Christy here, and time for another episode of Take <sighs> Chantoa has a mere 9,200 inhabitants, and Take Two. This is a good news story in that, once again, we're seeing the protection of children from religious... What is the word I'm looking for? No. Take, take Two. A Christian group that linked child disobedience with rich cups.